Originals. All right. Well, it's good to be back in church. Amen. Amen. And Sunday school was fun. I enjoyed uh, being here in Sunday school. And you know, if you're saved, you ought to tell your face. <laughs> Amen. If you're saved, you ought to tell your face about it. Smile. Amen. It's so much easier than frowning. And, and, and I, I tell you, I, I love coming to church. And I love being the first one there. I hate it when somebody beats me to church. I always want to be the first one there. And I'm always excited that this might be the Sunday that I get that truth that's going to change my life forever. It's going to make my life what God intended for it to be. And so I'm looking every Sunday morning and every Sunday night and every Wednesday night for a truth that's going to help me help my children and help my grandchildren. Amen. Now, I don't have grandchildren yet, but I'm going to. If the Lord doesn't come soon, I'm going to. And I want my children to serve God, and I want my grandchildren to serve God too. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate Brother Coleman. I, uh, he does not care what that clock says up there on the wall. Amen? Uh, I th only liberal churches get out at 12. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I, I think uh, you just can't put a time limit on God. Amen. And I looked at your sign last night. I got in about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. We walked out and I looked at your sign. It's a beautiful sign. And uh, we looked at all the buildings. I was so excited to see your buildings and your Sunday school classes. You have great buildings. But you know what I noticed on the sign? It has a start time, but it doesn't have a finish time. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Yeah. I got excited when I saw that. I thought, man, I can preach all day. <laughs> and keep smiling. <laughs> <laughs> now, we have food waiting on us, don't we? Right. Did anybody bring a pie? <laughs> Did anybody bring a dessert? We got. We do. Hallelujah! <laughs> I'm excited about that. Uh, how many of you like to eat? You have that problem like me. For uh, some of us do. Some of you are lying. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anybody that doesn't like to eat. Amen. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you having me come. And uh, it's a blessing to be uh, in, in God's house. It's, a, it's special for me to be here to preach for, with Brother Coleman because uh, we are dear friends. And he's preached for me twice. And uh, this is my first time to get down here. And uh, I hope he'll have me back. And I, I hope you'll have me back. And I appreciate your warm welcome and... and uh, the, the great time I had in Sunday school was a blessing. But I, I want to help you while I'm here. I don't want to just come and, and leave you with nothing. That I want to help you. I want to help your church. If you come back tonight, I'm going to preach to you on how to build a church on one verse. How to build a church on one verse. And it works. And so if you're interested in, in a, this side looks great. Uh, this side needs help. <laughs> Amen? And so if you're interested in filling this side up, you come back tonight. I know he is. Uh, and, and I know you are too. I'll tell you how to do it tonight, and it's easy. It's not hard. And so uh, I'm excited. We started the New Haven Baptist Temple in 1996. And uh, we started with just a small handful of people. I remember Wednesday nights, I'd preach to six people, uh, sometimes Sunday morning, ten. And uh, boy, it gets personal, doesn't it? Huh? It, when the preacher preaches on sin and there's only five of you, that kind of stings, doesn't it? But I'll tell you, it, our church has grown in grace. And uh, we're seeing folks saved every week, and folks are coming out going soul winning. 
And uh, I'll tell you, my first two soul winners were two widow women in our church, Wanda Bristow and uh, Mrs. Stinson. Two ladies in their 80s that go out soul winning and uh, helping the preacher lead people to Christ. Anybody can win somebody to Jesus. And so you come back tonight and it'll be exciting for you. And if you already made plans, make new plans because I'd like to see you tonight, okay? Uh, and and if, you, if you can talk him into it, I'll preach for you tomorrow night if you come back tomorrow night. Now, I know that's not on the schedule, but if, you get, if he wants me to, I will. Amen? So uh, if you have fun today, we'll do it again tomorrow if you want to. You say it's Monday, so... God's huh? Day off. Day off. Oh, oh. Well, uh, I forgot about that. Who's going fishing? Nobody's going fishing. Who's got family coming to town? Nobody. Who's going out of town? You are. You won't be here tomorrow night, will you? The rest of you, I'll see you tomorrow night. No, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. And uh, take your Bibles this morning, turn to Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13. I get confused on Memorial Day because my birthday is traditional Memorial Day, May the 30th. And I celebrate that day, I don't celebrate the observed Memorial Day. And so I get messed up, but I'm glad to be here. I want to preach to you. I want to preach to you this morning on the subject... It ain't never been this late before. Now, I know that's not good English, but it's good English where I come from. It ain't never been this late before. If you look in Romans 13 and verse number 10, the Bible says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, that's mindless living not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. We thank you for each and every person that's here today. And we know that everyone is special and, and a person is a person, no matter how small the world may think they are, they're a big deal to you. And I pray that you'd bless. Come alongside me and help me now. And Lord, I pray that this message would not only make a difference in this church, but that it would make a difference in my life as well. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I get into this message, I would like to finish Sunday school for a moment. We preached on loving and delighting in God's Word. And it's an amazing thing when we look at history and we see great men like Lewis Berry Schaefer. Uh, on his last day of teaching at Dallas Theological Seminary, he was in a wheelchair. He was uh, 80 years old at the time, somewhere in there. And he closed his class, he dismissed his class, and he began to wheel out to the door. No one said anything, no one clapped, no one did anything, and he turned off the light and wheeled his wheelchair out into the hallway, and the students began to clap for Dr. Schaefer. And then Dr. Schaefer turned his wheelchair around and wheeled back to the room, and with tears streaming down his face, he said, I have spent over half of my life teaching and preaching the grace of God. And I'm just now starting to understand. And he wheeled that wheelchair out and the class stood as he began, and clapped as he left for his last day. And then there was another preacher, a Dr. Henry Dick Wilson of Princeton University. He spoke 
47 languages and dialects. He could quote the Hebrew New Testament without missing one syllable and he taught there most of his life. And at the end of his career, they had all of the student body in that college to ask whatever questions they would. This is a man that taught there in the Bible department most of his life. And he stood and a student raised their hand and they said, Dr. Wilson, what is the greatest truth you ever learned? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. From a man that knew all of that, he came up with that great truth. Amen? Amen. And two of my most favorite songs today is Jesus Loves Me and Jesus Loves the Little Children. And if you get anything today, please get that, that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. In verse 9 and 10, love clearly shows the believer's positive commitment and active obedience to God. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Upright conduct is essential because of the near approach of complete salvation. Knowing the time that it's high time that we awake out of what? Sleep. Sleep. Physical sleep? No, spiritual sleep. Knowing the time. God says we know the time. God says we knowing the time. Uh, that it's high time. Uh, I remember as a little boy growing up in West Texas uh, and when we were in real bad trouble and mom would tell us to go do something and we'd mess around and mess around and wouldn't get it done and mama would say, it is high time that you get in there and do what I told you. Amen? High time. And so when God says it's high time, that means that God said right now, I want you to see this. I want you to do this. It's time. Knowing the time that it's high time. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. Uh, Number one this morning, it's high time to be separated from the wickedness of the world. All throughout the Bible, we see a line drawn between good and evil, between righteousness and wickedness, between that which is right and between that which is wrong. God always draws a line between good and evil. And you know what I know? I know that everyone here today knows that. God God knows every child of God believes and knows that God has drawn a line and said, this is right, this is wrong, this is for my kids, and this is not for my kids. And the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord of hosts. You say, how come? God said, I want my people to be a peculiar people. The Bible says they think it strange. Because we're different. Why are we different? Because God drew a line and He said, this is right and this is for my kids. And this is wrong and this is not for my kids. And if my kids do this, I'll bless my kids. If my kids do this, I'll spank my kids. You say, does God really spank people? He said, whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth, even as a father a son in whom He delighteth. God delights in His children obeying Him. Uh, the beloved John Apostle said, uh, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. He didn't say, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about, I have no greater joy. He is a pastor, ha- didn't mean to spit on you. He is a pastor, has no greater joy than to hear from someone else that you, Jennifer, are walking uprightly. You see, every time your preacher sees you, he, you're walking uprightly. Because you want him to see you walking uprightly. But John said, I have no greater joy than to hear from someone else that my children walk uprightly. That's good. That's good. That is good. 
Whew, gives me, uh, gets me excited. When I go home, I want to hear that my kids obeyed Grandma and Grandpa. Amen? And then, oh, I'll be happy if they did. <laughs> but there's a difference between good and evil, light and dark. And I know God's people know this, but Paul the Apostle said, uh, we need to bring these things into remembrance. We need to be reminded constantly. When we preach at camp, we remind those kids every day of camp what's good and what's bad. We remind them that God loves them and the devil hates them. We remind them that God will bless them and the world will destroy them. And we need to be reminded of that because it's an encouragement. It's an encouragement to the child of God to hear the blessings that God has for you. And the blessings God has for you are so great they're incomprehensible to us. Let's play the amen game. Alright? We'll take a moment. We need to get us an amen corner. Alright? And uh, you keep her going after I go back to New Mexico, okay? I'm going to give you a Bible truth and you just say amen, okay? Uh, what is a Bible truth? No, I'm kidding. I believe in old, that old time religion. Amen. I believe in the King James Bible. Amen. I believe in salvation by grace. Amen. Through faith. Amen. <laughs> I believe in soul winning. I, I believe in uh, good old fashioned preaching. Amen. amen. So you can say amen. I know you can say it now. So you say it when God touches you to say it. Okay? High time to be separated. You say, Pastor, why is it high time that we're separated? I'll tell you why. Because we have churches today that are using Revelation chapter 3 for an excuse not to go soul winning. They say, well, we live in the Laodicean church age. There's no use in going because people aren't going to listen anyway. That's not true. I went soul winning Thursday night and I stopped four boys in the street. They were skateboarding. And I said, hey, what's y'all's name? Guess what? Uh, one of them was Zachariah, one of them was Daniel, one of them was Michael, and one of them was Caleb. Wow. Wow. And Michael and Daniel and Caleb and Zachariah got saved Thursday night. Amen. 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 And so people are still getting saved. It's not time to lay down and quit. You say, well, what's that got to do with separation? I'll tell you why. Because... The churches today have so much sin in their lives that the world will not believe I report. That's right. If I was on the street looking into God's house and I saw God's people living in sin, why would I want that when I already got it? I would want to see a people that were different, that were separated, that were happy. Smile at me that were happy and excited about going to church and I would want to come into that place and I would want to see what was going on and then the gospel, when I heard it, would touch my heart and I'd get saved. Amen? Amen? That's what we need. We, it's high time that we get separated for the Lord. You say, how do I get separated? Listen to Him. He'll teach you how. <laughs> Amen? He'll teach you how. I don't have time to teach you. He's going to teach it to you. Amen? Amen. Alright? <laughs> Number two. It is high time to awake. Uh, i got to tell you this. There was a, an old farmer and he had a grandfather clock. Any of you have a grandfather clock? I love those things. This old farmer had a grandfather clock and he was laying in bed one night and he was dozing off and it started donging. Dong, dong, and he started counting the dong on the clock. And he said, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And he jumped out of bed and he ran in there and turned around and ran back in there and said, Wake up, Ma! It ain't never been this late before. <laughs> he got excited. Why? It ain't never been this late before. 
God said the time is far spent. That means it's almost over. That means that you will put the icing on the cake of the church age. And when we stand before Jesus, He's going to look at that cake. And I hope and I pray that the icing, the decoration, goes all the way around the cake. I hope that there's not a section missing because the New Haven Baptist Temple did not do what God said we're supposed to do. It's high time to awake. It is high time to awake and put on the Lord Jesus Christ, number two. To put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, how do you do that? Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Now listen to me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I'm going to quote that to you again. Now watch me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so, I'm living the life that Christ would have lived had He not died on the cross. So I am supposed to awake because it is high time that I put on the Lord Jesus Christ and I put the old man down and step on him and let Christ live through me. See? That's what I meant this morning when I said you're created in Christ a new creature. Everything's brand new. Isn't that great? And it can be brand new every day of your Christian life if you let Jesus do it. Amen? Amen? Now, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly. You know, I believe God still wants His people to be an honest people. Yes, amen. I believe God still wants preachers to be honest people. Yes. I think it's important. I who, nobody's going to get saved if everybody's a crook. Right. Amen. I believe God's people ought to be mindful people, mindful of their living, mindful of how they behave, mindful of what they say, mindful of how they treat others. It is high time that we awake and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a great verse that says that our life is hid with Christ in God. Can I tell you what that means? Our life is hid with Christ in God. You know what I see a lot of Christian people doing today? They're going out into the world trying to find happiness. They're going out in... That's what I see teenagers doing. Going out into the world and trying to find joy. Trying to find peace. Trying to find satisfaction. But you know what, Brother Coleman? If our life for the child of God, if you're saved, your life is hid with Christ in God. You're not going to find any peace unless it's in Jesus. You're not going to find any joy unless it's in Jesus. You're not going to find any happiness unless it's in Jesus. You say, how come? Because our life is hid with Christ in God. And everything that the child of God has and needs is with Christ, not in the world. I get excited about that because I know where to go. Yes. Amen? I know how to get things because I know where to go get it. You're not going to find it in a nightclub. No joy there. You're not, you're not going to find it there. You're not going to find it in a bottle. You're not going to find it in a beer can. You're not going to find it in a cigarette. There is no joy in there. Your joy is in Jesus. That's why it's important that you come back to church every time the door's open because that may be the very sermon that you hear that will change your life forever. Number three, it's high time that we see through the eyes of our Savior. I want you to take your Bibles quickly and turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Yeah. 
I want you to look in verse 36 with me. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad I'm saved. Let me give you some acrostics, okay? Joy. Jesus owns you. That's good, isn't it? Joy. Jesus owns you. Uh, here's another one for you. Him. H-I-M. Him. He is mine. And uh, fanatic. If your neighbors call you fanatic because you want to win souls, if you if your family calls you fanatic because you want to win souls and you go to church three times a week, tell them that it stands for friends and neighbors all trusting in Christ. Hey. Amen. Amen. Remember this morning in Sunday school when I told you to look for a good report? There it is. There it is. Alright, now look at what we need to look through the eyes of Jesus. The Bible says in verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, O Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Number one, I want you to know Jesus saw the multitude. Folks, we got to see the multitude. Now I want to tell you what Jesus saw that day. You say, why was He moved to compassion? When I look at Brother Coleman, when I look at his physical person, if he was in a crowd of people, what about his looks besides that he doesn't have any hair? Would I have compassion on him? Huh? He looks perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. Nice looking man. Why would I have compassion on that man? Why did Jesus, when he saw the multitude, why was he moved with compassion? I'll tell you why. Because God has placed a veil on our eyes and we do not see as Jesus saw. Jesus did not have a veil upon his eyes. When Jesus looked at men, and women and boys and girls, He saw their heart. He saw their sin. He saw their thoughts. Can you imagine walking into a city with multitudes of people and seeing behind that closed door what went on last night? Seeing in the darkness what happened in that city and what happened among those people. And Jesus was weeping and moved with compassion because He saw that multitude. And if He were standing here today and he's, he's in heaven today, but He sees us and He sees us how we are. And you cannot escape the all-seeing eye of God and the all-reaching hand of God. You cannot. And when Jesus sees us, His people, sleeping, not awake, not excited about souls, not excited about people getting saved, I believe He weeps. I believe He weeps when we have sin in our lives. And I believe He weeps when we don't go to the altar and get our hearts right. It is high time that we see through the eyes of our Savior. We must have compassion in every area. Compassion is remembering what God has done for you. I read a verse that our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. When I was 15 years old, I got saved. How old are you, Monica? 13. You've got a great future ahead of you. But I got saved when I was 15. And I remember reading in the Psalms, uh, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And I remember going out into my backyard and kneeling down and looking up into the sky at all the the universe up there and how big it was and thinking why would he care about me and how small I must be why compassion is remembering what God did for you I don't know how people could go through their Christian life and not remember every day what Jesus did for them how they could not remember the day that they were standing in a pew and uh, holding on so tight and the preacher said, come. And they resisted and the Holy Spirit of God pricked their heart and said, no, you need to get saved. 
And you stepped out, and as the moment you stepped that foot out of that aisle, that burden came off as you walked down to the aisle, and you got, uh, got that on your knees, and you trusted Christ as your Savior. I don't know how a person could live a day without remembering that. And if you're going to be a soul winner, if you're ever going to reach anybody else for Christ, you have to remember what Jesus did for you. The disciples went into the cities and villages telling what Jesus had done for them. Your best witness is your testimony. Telling others how Christ saved you. Compassion is comprehending the love of Christ for sinners. Comprehending the love of Christ for sinners. For God so loved the world. Everybody knows that verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, I'm, I like that, amen, 543 times that word's in your Bible. Whosoever. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Whosoever me, whosoever you. <laughs> For God so loved the world. You know, there's something unique about God's love. People today say, hey, love you. Well, what does that mean? Love you. Love you too. No. God said, God so loved the world. Now, if you were in the South where I come from, you would stop on that word so and figure out what so meant. He so loved me. He didn't just love me. He so loved me. And that's the difference. Because when you say, I so love, then there's some quality to that love. And what is that quality to, the, to God's love? The quality is that Jesus died on the cross for you. That is the so, S-O. He so loves you Amen. that He proved it to you by letting Jesus die for you. In that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. He died for you because He loved you. And He knew you were a sinner before He died for you. Isn't that good? Isn't it good that He loved you at your worst? And if He loved you at your worst, don't you think He'll use you at your best? You bet He will. Oh, we need to See through the eyes of Jesus. Compassion is the awareness of judgment. Compassion is the awareness of judgment. There was a young man at our church singing last week. He is a preacher's son. His older brother was a preacher's son. And that young man had graduated from Bible college and had preached in a church for one year. And then he began to run from God and began to live in sin. That young man died right here in this city. He was on a motorcycle. And he, stopped, he was stopped by the police for speeding. And he knew that there was a law that if you run from the police, they can't chase you. I don't know if that's true. Is that true in town? Never heard of it? This is what I was told. But he thought that that was true and he took off on the motorcycle and he was going about 70 miles an hour on whatever street he was on and a police jeep pulled out in front of him so he would stop. And he couldn't stop. And he hit that police jeep. This just happened a few months ago. And it exploded. And he was burned beyond recognition. Why, Pastor? The, the younger brother told me why when he was at our church. Proverbs 29.1 He being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed and without remedy. I believe that it's time for the church to fear God again. I believe there ought to be some reverence there. I believe there ought to be some fear there. I mean, I don't think we ought to run around uh, hiding from the Lord because we're afraid, but there was a time in America and a time in our land where we feared God and we reverenced God. And I think that we ought to do that again. When the Bible said, He being often reproved, what we do is we reprove, we preach, we exhort with all long suffering and doctrine every week over and over and over and we remind you of things and you're like I'm sick of hearing that but amen <laughs> you know but, but he being often reproved 
hardeneth his neck. When a, when a farmer would take a, and carve a, a yoke for an ox, and he would carve that yoke to fit that one ox. And the no, ox next to him may have a different size neck. He'd carve a yoke to fit him so that he wouldn't get sores on his neck from plowing all day. And it would fit perfectly around the ox's neck. The ox got smart. He'd see the farmer coming in the afternoon and he, uh, in the morning. And he would remember yesterday how he pulled that plow all day and how that farmer whipped him all day and how he worked all day. And the farmer would go to put the yoke on his neck and he'd flex his neck like that and the yoke wouldn't fit. He said, well, what does that mean? The verse says, He being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. It means when we harden our neck, we're saying, don't put that yoke on me. I'm not pulling that plow for you. And we're not telling it to him, we're telling it to him. I'm not going soul winning. I, I'm not going to be separated. He being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed without remedy. You know that part without remedy is the scariest part. It means even if you have a doctor, they can't save you. Without remedy. There's a time when we go too far and we rebel too long. And God says, that's it. And in Revelation chapter 10, there's a Jesus is going to say, uh, during that great tribulation period, He's going to say, there'll be time no longer. That's it. I believe it's vital that we fear God, that we honor God, respect God. And I believe that we ought to honor this book and we ought to, and we ought to read it and we ought to take care of it. My grandmother used to teach us how to take care of the Bible. We didn't go home from church and toss it on the bed. We didn't uh, go home and just throw it on the table. And we never threw it on the floor. I, I, I know we're not supposed to worship the Bible. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ. But there ought to be some respect there. Yes. Some honor there. When you go home, you have a nice place for your Bible. And you put it in that nice place. And you, when you look at it, you remember what God did for you. I mean, men died to give us this. Right. I believe that we ought to, it's high time that we fear God. And then it is high time that we awake and praise the Lord. I had to get praise the Lord in there. It's praise the Lord Sunday. <laughs> it's high time that we awake and praise the Lord. Satan loves reminding us of our past. Doesn't he? He's the accuser of the brethren. Man, you start getting on fire for God and he'll start whispering in your ear. Yeah, I remember what you did. Isn't that discouraging? Isn't that terrible? And then you feel bad and you don't think that you can do what God wants you to do. You think you don't have the ability. Well, if you're saved, greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. You have the ability. God gives you the ability. And when He reminds you of your past, you remind Him of His future. <laughs> Amen. His day is coming. Jesus already said so. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever. You know what one of the greatest things about heaven, Brother Coleman, is? The, one of the greatest things about heaven is there will be nothing to enter in that defileth. No devil. Amen. Amen. And the gates are open all the time. You don't have to lock them. Whew, that's good. <laughs> no devil. Just getting him out of the way is going to be heaven. Amen. No more accusation. Amen. No more accusing. He'll not be able to whisper in my ear, you remember what you said? I already confessed that. But you still said it. The Bible says if we resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Amen? Amen. Now you need to remember these verses. If we resist the devil, he'll flee from you. You know what? There are the Bible says, if you'll keep reading in the next chapter, it says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. And there are going to be those of you in this church that are weaker than others. Weaker in your faith. Weaker in your victory. Weaker in the areas that the devil causes you to be oppressed or to be depressed. 
and you are going to fight those battles. But you need to know today that even though you're going to go through those trials and go through those times, He's going to receive you. And He's going to receive you and this body is going to receive you. You say, why will they? Because God commanded us to do so. Divine fellowship is the strong fellowshipping with the weak and bringing the weak up. Amen. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. I love eating lunch with new converts. <laughs> we had a Father's Day uh, service in the mountains. i got to close. We had a Father's Day service in the mountains. I'm getting hungry, aren't you? <laughs> we had a Father's Day service in the mountains, and I had a new convert there. And he came up to me, and he said, Hey, preacher, I tried to bring a six-pack of beer, but my wife said she'd kill me. I was like, thank God for your wife. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? You know what? I said, come on, let's go. We really need to have a talk. And I had a real nice talk with him about it and explained to him why his wife was going to kill him. Because it's not expedient. Amen? And he learned something that day. But isn't that fun? I, I love new converts. Boy, they just brighten everything up and they're, they're just exciting watching them grow in grace. I think that we need to look at that verse very hard. It is high time that we awake out of sleep for our sight. For our salvation, the night is far spent. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. When did you get saved, Monica? Last Sunday? Your salvation is nearer today than it was last week. Isn't that exciting? You're closer to heaven today than you were last week. Isn't that good? <laughs> I've been saved 21 years. I'm 21 years closer to my salvation than I was the day I got saved. Amen. And I remember the day that I got saved, man, I was excited. I was standing at the altar weeping and people were shaking my hand and I, I was just overwhelmed. I didn't know, I never had nobody shake my hand like that and I, I, I was just weeping. And my brother was, just got saved. He was weeping too and we were just boo-hooing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But you know what? I ought to have more joy today and be more on fire for God today because I'm closer to heaven than I was then. Amen. That's good, isn't it? I'm getting closer by the minute. And so I ought to get more excited by the minute. I was reading in Revelation, you know it's hard to get a Baptist church to say hallelujah. I just don't hear it. Hallelujah. Amen. And but in Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says, or 17, the Bible says there was a great voice in heaven of a multitude saying, Hallelujah! For salvation. Amen. Four times they said, Hallelujah. I think we ought to practice that a little. Don't you? I think by the time I get there, I ought to have that down. Don't you? I don't want it to be something I never heard before. I want to be warmed up and ready. Don't you? Isn't that exciting to know that you're closer to being with Jesus today than you were the day you got saved? Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Let's bow our heads. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. You've never been saved. You say, Pastor, if I died today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. I'd like to pray for you. Is there one that would say, Preacher, I'm not saved? <clears throat> Maybe there's somebody here that will say, Preacher, I thought I was saved, but I'm not. I haven't trusted Christ as my Savior. I was saved in my head, but not in my heart. And I want to get it settled today. Is there one? Can I pray for you? How many of you would say, Preacher, I want to get on fire for God. I want to have joy and happiness. And I want to be in the center of God's will. And I want to do what God wants me to do. God spoke to my heart today. Pray for me. Could I pray for you?
you're saved and you know it, but you want to do God's will. You want to do God's will and you want to have joy? Could I pray for you? Is there one that will raise their hand? God bless you. Amen. Is there another? I just want to pray for you. God bless you. In the back. Amen. Father, bless those that raise their hands. Lord, this might be the last sermon that we hear. You could come today. And I pray that you would work in hearts now. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you go from person to person, pew to pew. And I pray that whatever is in every heart, you would show it to us. If it's wrong, help us to get it right. If it's right, help us to keep on pressing forward. And help us to be excited about our faith in Jesus. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Coleman. Let's stand together, if you would. Remember what God is to you and praise Him because He's God. Praise Him because He's God. And I heard some of you give testimony to that a while ago. And then praise Him because He's the Father of our Lord Jesus. And then we ought to praise Him because He is the God of all comfort. And then we ought to praise Him because He is the God of all mercy. And we ought to praise Him because God enables us to bear our trials. To bear our troubles. Amen. And when we die to self, it is then that His power can work in our lives. God delivers us from our trials. When Paul reported what God had done for him, a great course of praise went up. God likes getting the glory. Amen. The Bible says that no flesh should glory in His presence. He wants to get the glory for it. And that's exciting. But I brought a poem with me today to read to you and uh, listen, listen to it. It's called Praise the Lord. When clouds seem thick around you and troubles seem to drown you, praise the Lord. When you suffer pain and grief and you've prayed in Jesus' name, praise the Lord. When your prayer brings no relief from your pain and grief, praise the Lord. When someone says things that offend, remember this, my friend, praise the Lord. When troubles come in like a flood, remember you're under the blood, praise the Lord. When it rains or it shines, when folks are mean or when they're kind, praise the Lord. When you feel so blue and you don't know what to do, praise the Lord. Beloved, don't give way to tears, anxieties, and fear. Just praise the Lord. Look up in Jesus' face. He will give you more grace. Praise the Lord. When it seems you cannot stand, just take hold of Jesus' hand and praise the Lord. Praise Him all the while and do it with a smile. Praise the Lord. Life would be so sweet if you kneel at Jesus' feet and praise the Lord. When tribulations come, do not try to win, just praise the Lord. You will be so content with whatever He has sent if you just praise the Lord. You will be happily surprised how far away Satan flies when you praise the Lord. It is an expression of love to our Lord above when we praise the Lord. I could not... Strength and weakness says, I could not do without thee, I cannot stand alone. I have no strength or goodness, nor wisdom of my own. But thou, beloved Savior, art all in all to me, and perfect strength and weakness is theirs who lean on thee. Isn't that a blessing? What a tremendous poem. Author is unknown. And uh, that's how it always works out. The great ones, we don't know who wrote them. But isn't that a blessing? Let's sing a song together. If you can stand singing with a Texan. All right. I've had a lot of fun today and look forward to tonight. Let's wait on the song. We're... Oh, he's ready. Okay. Amen. Okay. Amen. I'm glad this is not ice cold water. <laughs> okay, let's stick this in here. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, okay. Then just turn around and face that way. All right. This is, um, hmm.
Not Angela. Mrs. Brooks. Yeah, Karen. <laughs> Karen Brooks. Okay. I had no had an E in the end in there somewhere. Uh, Karen Brooks, as you know, last week, uh, she was brought up more, or at least was going to a Mormon church, and and uh, she didn't want to go there anymore, and she wanted to come visit, and she heard the gospel last week, and and understood what it really means to be saved by Jesus Christ and trust in Christ as her Savior. And so she wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. So Karen, uh, I'm glad you're saved. All right. So in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior and upon your pu public profession of your faith in Him as Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Buried in the likeness of His death and raised in the likeness of His resurrection. God bless you, Karen. Amen. Isn't that good? That's something to praise the Lord for, huh? Amen. Salvation. Another person saved from hell. Glory to God. And another person willing to obey the Lord. That's exciting. We've got so many folks who don't want to nowadays. All right, Monica, come ahead. All right, watch your step on those, on those uh, bricks, okay? All right, this is Monica Monroy. And this is the niece of, of some of my wife met a while back when we were soul winning on 38th Avenue, street I used to live on. Amen. I should point, it, point it out to her the house I used to live in. And uh, so we were, I was glad to go soul winning. I'm an old neighborhood. And uh, so Monica has trusted Christ as her Savior also and wants to follow the Lord. So Monica, stand up here, please, so you don't hit your head on the back. A little bit closer. Okay, there you go. All right, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior and upon your public profession of faith in Him, I baptize you, Monica, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Buried in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His resurrection. Amen. God bless you, Monica. Amen. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. Praise the Lord. God's good, isn't He? Yes, sir. Still in the salvation business. Yes. And uh, if He's in that business, I want to get in it too, don't you? Amen. Isn't that great? All right. Praise the Lord. So, uh, take a, well, we'll dismiss. Why don't you all sing a song when we close? Uh, when we, let's have a, a, a final song, and then that'll give us time to get out so you can be sure and greet the folks afterwards and, and, uh, and express your your joy and, and praise the Lord with them that they have followed the Lord in believer's baptism and encourage them to be faithful to church, encourage them to get to know the Lord more and read their Bibles and let's, let's help them grow, all right? Amen. And uh, they might need you to look up to, so, so let's be all that we ought to be, all right? Let's pray and then you can uh, sing a song while we get rechanged. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings of today. Thank you for Brother Black for the great messages we've heard today that remind us some things we need to know or some new things and some things that we knew but we need to be reminded of. I pray that you'd help us to take these things home and meditate on them and think on them and help us to always have submissive hearts to you that you might uh, do a work in our heart and cause us to change more to the image of Christ. Bless us now. Bless these two who have followed you in believer's baptism, who have testified of trusting you as Savior. Bless them as they grow and continue to, to seek to know you and to know the Word of God. And help us, the rest of us, to be good examples to them and encouragers to them and teachers of them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.